All right, everybody, I'd just like to go over the lecture we did or the discussion we had uh, recently about speciation, reproductive isolation, um, and segueing into taxonomy. We didn't quite get there. Using the Anole Virtual Lab from HHMI that we did in class the past few days. So I'd like to start off by reviewing that lab, talking about why it's relevant to everything we've done so far and what it means for the bigger picture going forward in light of evolution and how new species are formed. So let's talk about anoles. In module one, we spent a lot of time looking at morphology. So you had pictures of different lizards and you grouped them together based on characteristics you thought were important and then you labeled those groups probably based on morphology. And then you took a bunch of measurements. You measure the body length, the leg length, uh, or the hind limb length, I should say, the tail length, and you also measured the number of toe pads on each lizard. Then you did some calculations, calculating relative hind limb length, relative tail length, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and you graphed those values on a graph. Uh, this graph that we can see here is what it is supposed to look like. On the x-axis, we've got the relative hind limb length, which is basically the length of the back legs in relation to how big the body is. So um, basically if the higher the number you have the longer you, your legs are in comparison to your body. And the same idea goes for relative tail length. The higher the number it is the longer your tail length is in comparison to your body. And if we look at these values we can see that there are some pretty uh, the, the colorations help a lot of course but there are some pretty clear groupings of different different um, set of characteristics for different ecomorphs of the lizards. So with the twig anole, we see that oh they have a relatively short leg length leg length compared to their body, and they also have a relatively short tail length compared to their body. And if we look at this image over here, we can see the twig lizard has pretty short legs and has a pretty short tail. And that makes a lot of sense based on its environment. It's living on small twigs. It's got to be able to hold on to those twigs, and having shorter limbs and tails is going to make it easier to do so. On the other hand, the grass bush anole, we can see it's got a, about the same relative hind limb length as the trunk crown and the trunk ground, but it's got a much longer relative tail length. And you can see, again, that's... Um, that's corroborated by the image here, this grass bush anole. You can see it's got a really long tail compared to some of the other ones, right? So uh, the purpose of the tail in that environment could be to help them run through the grass, to help them climb up small bushes, could be a variety of things. But the point is, we see these lizards uh, kind of falling out into different categories because what we see is that, well, depending on where you live, whether you live on the twigs, the trunk ground, the trunk crown, the grass bush, you're going to develop, you're going to evolve, nature is going to select certain characteristics, right? So the trunk ground anole has been, nature has selected for uh, relatively long hind limbs and relatively medium tail lengths. The grass bush anoles, nature has selected for relatively long hind limb length and relatively long tail length and you could go on and on and the reason for that is because this this uh, the reason for that can be encapsulated in this idea of an ecomorph eco meaning the environment or ecology think ecosystem morph meaning shape and form much like morphology or to morph if you were to morph into something else metamorphosis you're going to change shape you're going to change form so ecomorph has to do with the body plan of an individual or a species based on where they live, based on their environment. And we see that, well, look at all these different environments over here. They all have slightly different body types. Some of them are more drastic than others, like the grass bush or the crown giant. But depending on where you live, you have different characteristics. And that's because depending on where you live, there are going to be different needs. There are going to be slightly different food sources, slightly different environments, slightly different forms of shelter, slightly different predators. And each species is going to need to adapt to those environmental pressures accordingly, right? So that's this idea of an ecomorph, um, meaning that uh, 
uh, an organism is going to adapt its body type based on where it lives. And you can see that reflected in this graph here. In module two, we further explored ecomorphs. And we also explore, explore the lineage and the history of these different types of anoles by creating phylogenies or phylogenetic trees. Those are basically like family trees, but for species instead of family members. And on a phylogenetic tree, we, uh, the branches are proportional to evolutionary time. So you can think of this axis here this horizontal line I'm making with my mouse, you can think of that as time, where the further to the left you go, the older, the further back in time you go, and the further to the right you go, the more recent in time. So you can see that this one here uh, is, or uh, sorry, I should say, we always want to look at the nodes when looking at a phylogenetic tree, so we can see the most recent divergence and evolution is right here. Right? This node is where this one species splits off into two, Anolis cristatellus and Anolis pulcellus. That node is the most recent split, so this, these are the uh, quote-unquote youngest species. The oldest is going to be uh, this split here between Anolis chaplani and the rest of all the anoles. Okay, and so when we create a phylogeny, what we do is we take the DNA of all of these individuals, we plug it into a fancy-pantsy computational model that does all the work, does all the math, all the probabilities, statistics, all this stuff that is over my head and probably over yours too, maybe not. Um, it plugs that in and it spits out a tree that it, it generates based on the model, based on probability. And that tree tells us a little bit about how these organisms are related. Now in module two, you then had to use this tree and you had to label the tree in two different ways. You had to label it with ecomorph and you had to label with island. So with the ecomorph tree, we took all of the trunk crown anoles and we labeled them with green. We took all the twig anoles, we labeled them with red. All the trunk ground anoles labeled brown, all the grass bush anoles labeled yellow. And what we see is that Wait a second. It looks like it looks like all of these body types, these ecomorphs, evolved independently. Because the yellow ones, the grass bush anoles, don't share a common ancestor. Or well, they do this this node here, but their common ancestor wasn't a grass bush anole. We don't know. But what we see is that oh, they split, and then they split again, and then it evolved. So you so. Based on this graph, it would look like the ecomorphs evolved independently each time because they're not grouped together, right? If this, were, this one's yellow, if this one were yellow too, then that would make a lot of sense that, that this node, their common ancestor, was yellow. But that's not what we see. Instead, what we see is when we group things by island, we say, whoa, wait a second. Now we're seeing some patterns that look like they make sense, right? All of the closely related species in this group bunch are all from Puerto Rico. All the closely related species here are all from Hispaniola. The closely related species in this bunch had three different ecomorphs, but it just so happens they all live on the same island. That's not coincidence, okay? That's not coincidence at all. What that tells us is that, hey, when this lineage split here, one species stayed on Hispaniola and one migrated to Puerto Rico. And then when it was in Puerto Rico, it split another time and another time. So lizards on the same island are going to be more closely related to each other, no matter what their ecomorph is. doesn't matter what they look like, what their body type is. If they're on the same island, they're going to be more likely to be related to one another. And that's not exactly um, intuitive based on what we've learned about evolution, right? Um, evolution always is... The simplest answer is usually what's correct. And in this case, with the ecomorph, that doesn't look so simple. It looks kind of complicated. Yellow is all over the place. Brown's all over the place. But what actually happened is that, hey, Hispaniola and Puerto Rico have very, very similar habitats. They all have habitats that are like this. They all have the same environments. So... If that's the case, if Puerto Rico and Hispaniola have similar environments, wouldn't we expect to see similar ecomorphs? Well, the answer is yes, and that's what we do see. We do see similar ecomorphs, right? We see a grass bush anole on Puerto Rico or Hispaniola. 
Trunk ground anoles on Puerto Rico and Hispaniola. Twig anoles on both islands. Trunk crown anoles on both islands. That's because those ecomorphs, again, those are adaptations to the specific habitat. And if the habitat is the same, the adaptations are going to be the same, if not similar. But because they're on separate islands, they're going to be evolving independently from another. So the trunk crown anole on, uh, looks like, Puerto Rico is going to be evolving independently from the trunk crown anole on Hispaniola. So they're not actually going to be the same species, right? Just because they have similar characteristics doesn't mean they're the same species. That being said, just because of the same ecomorph doesn't mean they look the same either. If you remember back to your groupings, you know, you could have two trunk crown anoles that look pretty different, but they have the same ecomorph, right? So that's this idea of convergent evolution, where you can have evolution that converges on a particular set of traits because the selection pressures are similar, right? Uh, one example that I like to use is the convergent evolution of white fur in the Arctic or Antarctic. Think about all the different animals that live in the Arctic. You've got polar bears, Arctic foxes, Arctic terns, other Arctic birds, uh, Arctic hares, um, and you've got some penguins and stuff. They all have white fur or white feathers or white hair, and that's not coincidence. Again, that's because their environment, the selection pressure is, hey, the more you blend in, the better you'll do, whether it means to catch prey or to hide from predators. And in order to blend in, you need to have white colored hair or fur or feathers. So natural selection is going to select for individuals who have white hair or white feathers. And over time, the species are going to adapt and, and evolve to have white coatings, feathers or fur. And that's convergent, right? The fox and the hare and the bear and the, and the arctic tern, which is a bird, by the way, all share a common ancestor, of course, if you go back far enough. But they're not super closely related. You know, you've got a fox, a bear, a rabbit, and a bird. They're all kind of different. They're definitely different species, that's for sure. But we see this idea of convergent evolution, where even though they're separate species and they don't have homologous structures, uh, so to say, they are experiencing similar selection pressures, similar um, ecomorphs uh, end up evolving. So that's the that's kind of the the wrap-up between the first module and the second module. The third module is this is all about this experiment that the researchers conducted, right? So the important takeaways from this can be uh, enlightened with by asking ourselves these three questions. First of all, what was the purpose of their experiment? Well, let's let, let's open that question up even further. What's the purpose of any scientific experiment? I would say the answer to that is well, people conduct experiments to test questions, right? to explore, uh, to test hypotheses, to test questions, and see if they find support for their questions or not. So what, what questions were these scientists interested in? Well, I would say it has a lot to do with the ecomorphs. I think they, based on the video and the virtual lab, these scientists were asking the question, hey, does the, does the environment local environment of these lizards impact their evolution? Does it affect their ecomorphs, their adaptations? Let's find out. Let's see if it is really the environment that's impacting them or if it's something else that we, we're, we haven't thought of yet. So what they did is they took some lizards from the mainland population of Iron K where there's a lots of tall trees and they took some and they they originally put just one woman and, or one male and one female onto a smaller island where there's mostly bushes. And they came back every few generations and took data on hind limb length, body length, tail length, etc., etc. And over time, the population grew and they took more and more data. They kept track of everything. It's all detailed in the video. And what they found is that over time, even though that these lizards came from the mainland, from the tall trees where everybody had long tails and long arms to climb up the trunks and climb up the trees, they found that over many generations, the tail length and the limb length of the new lizards that were born there was actually shorter. They found that over generations, nature had selected for lizards to have shorter tails and shorter legs because that was going to increase their chance of survival.
So the lizards with long tails and long legs had trouble staying onto the branches, maybe had trouble hunting or hiding from predators, so they had a higher chance of dying. But the lizards that had slightly shorter tails and shorter legs had a higher chance of surviving. Those lizards survive, they pass those genes on to their offspring, those offspring are born with shorter legs and shorter tails, and the cycle continues. And over a few generations, you can actually see uh, a notable difference between the uh, mainland Iron K population having significantly longer tails and hind limbs and body lengths compared to the experimental island. So this, this, these results uh, lend support to their idea that the environment is, inf is influencing the adaptations that these lizards are evolving. Right? So this provides more support for this idea of ecomorphs depending on the environment. In the last module, uh, they looked at dewlap color. Dewlap is the flap of skin on the lizard's chin. I probably should have put a picture in here, but oops. Um, it's a flap of skin on the lizard's chin. It's, it's uh, highly colored. It can be bright green, bright yellow, bright orange, bright red. And it's, it's a mating tool, right? Much like birds have a mating songs, or um, some other birds do mating dances. So horn, uh, horned sheep or big, big horned sheep will fight each other uh, as like a mating ritual to win over the female. Much like that, the lizards use the dewlap to show off to the females of their same species and, and attract them into reproducing and, and having babies. So uh, some, depending on where an anole lives, is going to affect evolutionarily the color of their dewlap. If an anole lives in a very green habitat, say the top of a tree, their dewlap is, they're gonna be more successful at attracting, attracting a mate if their dewlap is a bright color on that green background. So maybe it's a bright red or a bright orange. But for a grass bush anole that lives in maybe a, a more brown or yellow area, it might be more advantageous for them to have a bright red or something uh, like a trunk ground anole that lives in kind of a brownie, reddy the bark of the tree. It might be beneficial to have, for them to have a bright yellow um, dewlap. So that way it sticks out and it's like, hey, hey, look at me. Right? The bigger the color contrast, the more likely that the, that the dewlap will be seen and that the female will recognize the male as a mate. What that means is over many generations, depending on the ecomorph, in the, in the local habitat of the anole, they're going to evolve different dewlap colors. And those dewlap colors are going to be ingrained in the behavior of these species. So, for example, uh, if we jump back to this picture here, say the crown giant anoles, they live in a green area, maybe they have a bright red dewlap. The, the only people who are going to mate with them are females who, attracted, who are attracted to bright red dewlaps. Uh, because that's what they learn to recognize over many generations of evolution. Whereas down here on the trunk, bright red maybe doesn't stick out as much, so bright yellow has a better chance. So if, if a female from the crown giant saw the trunk ground anole, the trunk ground would have a bright yellow dewlap, and she would see that and be like, uh, I'm only interested in, anole, in anoles with red dewlaps. I'm not going to reproduce with you. I'm not going to mate with you. And that's that idea uh, is, is an example of what we call reproductive isolation, what biologists call reproductive isolation, which means that two individuals, two species, two populations are isolated from one another, they cannot interact with each other, and they cannot re reproduce with one another. And that could be for a variety of reasons. In this case, with the bird songs or the dewlap color, it has to do with mating rituals and behaviors, but it could also be due to physical separation or separation in time. Maybe they do not awake and mating at the same time of the day or even the time of the year. So this idea of reproductive isolation is kind of what is providing the momentum for this unit um, in regards to how new species are formed. So this is a quick review of the lizard lab and it segues into this overarching question that I always ask my students when we talk about evolution, populations, um, and speciation, which is what is the ultimate instinct of an individual, a population, or a species? What's the goal? Um, and their goal is always to reproduce and have offspring. That's the goal, because the, their instinct is to 
pass on their genes, right? And they're going to be able to do that if they find food, they find a mate, they have babies, and they protect those babies. So what happens when two populations can't reproduce with one another? What happens when they're reproductively isolated, right? We see that uh, for whatever reason, they can't interact with each other, they can't reproduce, and they're going to start evolving separately. This is a great video. Uh, the Cornell University's Lab of Ornithology has a video on speciation and sexual selection in birds. Just look up Cornell Lab Ornithology Speciation and you can find it on YouTube. It's a great video. Check it out. Um, but let's talk about reproductive isolation in the form of anoles, right? So basically what happens is, well, we've got this anole species here at the top and let's say they get separated for some reason. Maybe this one migrates to Puerto Rico and this one stays on Hispaniola. That seems pretty uh, uh, relatable to the real world based on what we learned from the virtual lab. And once they get separated, even though their environments may be similar, they're going to be separated from one another. They're living on a different island. They can't interact with one another. So they're going to start evolving and they're going to evolve differently because they're living different lives, they're facing different selection pressures, they're in different environments, they're going to evolve differently, and those different evolutionary changes they experience are going to prevent them from mating with one another. So maybe this one evolves to be green with a red dewlap, and this one evolves to be brown with a red dewlap with an orange outside. If they come back together, you know, they're, they're not going to like each other's dewlap, they're not going to like maybe each other's habitat, skin color, the food that they eat, the time of day that they mate, the time of day that they sleep, uh, you know, the sounds that they make, who knows? Could be any number of things. But those changes are going to prevent them from mating. So, this is an overview of reproductive isolation. Let's break it down a little bit. Let's go back to step one, separation. How can species separate? Well, the example we used with one ending up on Puerto Rico and one ending up on Hispaniola uh, is what we can refer to as allopatric speciation, which is when species separate and then differentiate due to physical boundaries, physical separation. So the example here is that you've got some trees on a plot of land, and then allopatric speciation, an example of that would be if a river cut through or a landslide or an earthquake that caused a, a ravine to appear be in the population and separated the trees from one another. So they're going to start evolving independently from one another because they, they can't bridge the gap. They can't literally cannot build a bridge and, and bridge the gap. The other way that species could separate is through this process called sympatric speciation, which is basically everything that isn't allopatric, meaning that species differentiate in the same geographical area without a physical boundary or physical separation or anything like that, right? This might be due to differentiating on uh, or um, eating different food sources, living in slightly different areas, like the, the lizards lived in different parts of the tree. Um, it might be due to uh, one being nocturnal and one coming out during the day. could be due to a variety of reasons. Sympatric speciation is a lot harder to conceptualize for most students um, and most people in general because it's, it's hard to think of why, why would a population split if there's no physical separation. Um, but just think of the uh, example we did for homework with the cactuses and the spines. Um, basically the situation was that a bunch of tourists go out to the desert and they like to collect cactuses, but they only like to collect cactuses with a, me a, a medium amount of spines. If they have too many spines, they're not interested, it's too spiky, and if they have too few spines, it doesn't look cool enough. So they're only taking the medium spined ones home to put um, in a pot and, and plant or whatever. So what's left is that over time, you don't really see a lot of cacti with a medium amount of spines anymore. You see a lot of cacti with little to no spines, and you see a lot of cacti with a lot of spines. And over time, as that pattern continues, you might see that pattern exacerbated even more, which uh, might eventually lead to speciation. So that's an example of sympatric speciation. They're living in the same place. It's not a physical boundary. It's, it's an external force that's causing the species to differentiate into two different species. So that tells us a little bit about step one here, how species separate. But what about what comes after that? What, what kind of changes can they evolve that would prevent them from mating when they come back together in step three? So let's take a look. How do they stay separate? Well, there's these things called isolating mechanisms. 
These are changes that evolve in the population while the populations are separated from one another that are going to prevent them from mating with the original population. So there are a variety of examples for this. There are eco uh, <coughs> excuse me, ecological isolating mechanisms um, that might have to do with, for example, with the anoles, where in the tree they live. If they live in one area of the tree, they're not going to see anoles that live in another area of the tree, probably. It might also have to do with the food that they specialize on uh, or the, the places they sleep. Um, could be a variety of, a variety of things uh, playing into ecological isolating mechanisms. Um, for example, maybe, uh, let's think, maybe anoles mate when they're catching prey. Maybe they, they have sort of this ritual thing where they, they go out, they hunt, they catch some prey, and then afterwards they go and mate. Well, if one species of anole catches flies and the other species of anole eats fruit, then they're not going to be able to mate with each other because one will go catch flies and then will mate with the other anoles that are catching flies. And one, the other species will go eat fruit. Uh, the other species will go eat fruit and then it will mate with the anoles that are eating fruit. So they're not going to cross paths. Uh, that Leading into a second example of behavioral isolation, this has a lot to do with mating rituals. Uh, this could do with bird songs or bird dances or uh, rams or deers fighting each other's antlers. And this is also dewlap color um, and, and the way that they flash their dewlaps. So this mating rituals is all about um, the behavior of the organism and if one species sees another species' behavior and is like, I'm not attracted to that, I'm not going to mate with you. That's an example of an isolating mechanism, a behavioral isolating mechanism that will prevent them from mating with one another. Uh, the third example is temporal, um, the time in which they mate. This cartoon, I think, sells it pretty quickly and pretty simply. Uh, one flower is saying, Ted, wake up, it's time to release the pollen. And the other one says, ugh, give me a few more months. So if one flower blooms in early June and one flower blooms in late July, they're not going to be blooming at the same time and they're not going to be able to mate. They're not going to be able to pollinate one another. There's a great example with frogs, which I think is really cool. Some frogs call at like 8 p.m. They do their mating calls and some frogs call at like 3 a.m. and they do their mating calls. And because of that, they're, they don't ever mate with each other. And so over time, they've evolved enough differences that they're technically separate species. A uh, fourth example of an isolating mechanism is mechanical. This is when the pieces don't fit. Physical incompatibility, right? Uh, so for example, an elephant cannot have sex with an ant. Just not, would not work. If you want an example that is a little bit more realistic, think of a Great Dane having sex with a Chihuahua. Again, would not work. Um, another great example is uh, ducks. Ducks have, male ducks have uh, penises that are kind of spiral or corkscrew cork shaped, and female ducks have corkscrew shaped vaginas. So those ducks can mate, but if one of those ducks were to try and mate with a swan or a goose or maybe even a similar type duck that doesn't have the corkscrew shaped vagina or penis, then they're literally physically unable to have sex. And that's obviously going to prevent them from having kids. Uh, let's see. And the last two have to do with the uh, offspring and viability has to do with the survivability of the baby. Um, either the sperm and egg don't fuse properly or they do fuse but the fetus dies. And offspring infertility has to do with, well, yeah, you can produce babies, but the babies aren't fertile. So a great example is a horse and a donkey can have babies. They have a mule. A mule is a, a hybrid between a horse and a donkey. But the mule itself is infertile. It's sterile. It cannot have kids. And so donkeys and horses are therefore separated from each other. Iso they're isolated from one another reproductively. Because even though they can have sex, they can't produce uh, a heritage going down many generations. They can only have you know, one generation of, of mules, and then those mules can't have kids. So the, the offspring can't continue down the line. So if... So that... that that kind of sums up and gets into more detail about how they separate and what kind of changes they can evolve that will keep them from mating. And if they stay separated for long enough, they can become separate species. And this is a process we call speciation. And it can be 
you can think about it through this model of disruptive or sometimes they call it diversifying selection where you see select if this is the original population we see selection against the mean which is going to depress the mean uh, trait and the extremes will get favored uh, afterwards so we see that oh if this is say dewlap color and this is really dark dewlap this is really light dewlap maybe we'll see that well for some reason the average middle dewlap color selected against and we have these two extremes of a darker dewlap and a lighter dewlap and over time that the pressure can continue and these these this M shape can instead turn into like two ends where these these curves are actually totally separate from one another and you have two species um, so that's that's pretty much all we cover today about reproductive isolation um, and reviewing the anole virtual lab if you have questions please let me know happy to help um, yeah